celebrate the 188th birthday of Washington Gladden, a father of social justice ministry, and the foundation for the ministry that has defined First Congregational Church. I dedicate this sermon to his memory. Would you please join me in prayer? Oh God, we receive such abundance in this light life, yet there are times when we feel inadequate and in, and in need of your assurance and blessing. As I share my meanings of Jesus' teachings, may there be a blessing for those who receive them, and may each of us be transformed by your presence among us this day. Amen. For literally, literally thousands of years, humans have been trying to explain God. God is a mystery. But it is far too simple to stop there. We call divinity by many names. God, Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, Christ, Tao, the Goddess, the Great Spirit, Creator, and there are any number of other names. The Hindu tradition says there is only one, na one Rama, and Rama has a thousand names. Other religions say that there are any, an infinite number of names for God. When my father returned from a mission trip in Nicaragua, he had a better understanding of that phrase, mucho religio uno deo. Many religions, one God. It was the 11th century philosopher Anselm who offered the argument, God is something than which nothing greater can be thought. By God, he meant that, that that which is absolutely unsurpassable, that which cannot conceivably be improved upon, that which is inherently spiritual. You know, explaining God and interpreting God's messages <coughs> elicits fear in me. What if I get it wrong? And I probably will. What will that mean? In my search for God, I have sometimes personified God as father, as mother, parent, friend, lover, gardener, architect, chess player, potter, weaver, composer. In my love of music, I especially resonate with God, the composer. I can see the music that the great symphony, I can see the music, especially um, the music that takes shape and, and is arranged and rearranged by directors, that is nuanced by players in the orchestra, given voice by performers in the opera. And energized, energized by the boys in the band, the notes, flat on the page come to life in sharp dissonance and, and resonance, intoning beauty and strength, peace and disharmony. What has been created and interpreted becomes both raucously heart-thumping, foot-stomping, and soothingly mind evocation of the spirit. Yet, as Anselm so aptly tells us, God is greater than composer, or any of those other images I have listed or not listed. But you know, what great fun to play with these metaphors. In recent years, the personification I attribute to God is through those I encounter. The presence of God in you, and the person sitting next to you. More than any other way, I encountered God through the, through the action of God. 
from the very beginning and throughout the Bible, it is through the activity of God that we have knowledge of God. We speak of the action of God working in transactional and transformational ways to affect creation. In our praying, we ask for God to heal or to alter, and we express thanksgiving for what God has already done. In Jesus' most powerful stories, he does not mention God at all. Yet we would be blind not to see the action of God in the healings, the, the exorcisms, and the parables. In the action of God is the experience of God. And one of God's actions is to speak. God speaks even before there are humans. God's speech calls humans into, into being. God said, let us make humankind. Later, God speaks directly to humans, saying, be fruitful and multiply. And at, you know, as we say in the United Church of Christ, God is still speaking, not only in Scripture or, or to our ancestors, but to us today. But while God speaks, humans struggle to hear. At times, God must repeat God's self several, several times. In the Exodus, God called out, Moses, Moses. And again, he called out, Moses, Moses. Sometimes God's voice is heard loudly and clearly, such as at the baptism of Jesus and, and here on the mountain. Other times, it is a still, small voice that we must listen for carefully. In my vocational life, I experienced God speaking through the voices of patients and their families at Nationwide Children's Hospital. In recent days, I enjoy the freedom to travel and to experience God's great diversity. I love exploring the vastness of the world, and I especially enjoy a good walk in the woods. These are my mountaintop experiences. Whether it's looking over the rim of a volcano in Guatemala to see the flowing red-hot lava, watching eagles play over Puget Sound, wondering at the size and the power of the bison strolling the roads in South Dakota, or feeling the sun break through bare-leafed trees in one of our metro parks, I am awed by the character of God in all of creation. Peter, James, and John were on the mountaintop with Jesus. Unexpectedly, without warning or announcement, they experienced the mystery that is God. To experience the mystery of God is to have a spiritual encounter. Some, some may even call it mystical. Although the magnitude of the experience frightened them, they wanted to hold on to the experience to make it last. Much like you or I might want to preserve our beautiful, unique, and once-in-a-lifetime experiences, we might reach for our smartphone to take to take photos to share with friends and families on social media. In fact, I think this is a mountaintop right here. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. That, that's a good one. Um, oh, yeah, right here. This is the world we live in. The impulse to record and, and share, building up our digi digital images of, of self is strong, but it's not exactly new. This week's gospel passage reminds me that the human desire to, to contain moments existed before modern technology. It was the sometimes anxious and, and impetuous Peter 
who acknowledged the importance of, of the moment and suggested that building shrines was the right thing to do. His offer is, is both a recognition of the holy and an, an, an attempt to contain it. I love Peter's response because this could also be what I would want to do. Recognizing that I was experiencing something beyond my understanding, I would reach out to catch and to, to hold on to it. That moment on the mountain was a miraculous meeting with God. Peter, James, and John were good Jews and who had strong concepts of God and, and believed that God should be set apart to be revered and worshipped as in a temple. They glimpsed the divinity in Jesus' fully human flesh and they were, they were quite baffled and terrified. And then, Clouds descended, and God addressed Peter, James, and John in the darkness with a version of God's message to Jesus at his baptism. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. I think he's telling them you're missing the point here. Pay attention to this man. And those disciples seem to be both afraid and drawn to the moment. The offer to build tabernacles shows their desire, desire for permanence. Maybe, like us, they want to preserve the mountaintop experience. Yet, today's passage teaches us something important about a life of faith. We are not to stay, at, stay up there on the mountaintop. God instructs us to listen to Christ. Just a chapter earlier, in fact, Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and, and take up their cross and follow me. We are to go out into the world, not stay in the temple. Listen to him. Go out. Lent. Yes, Lent is coming. But for today, we are on the mountaintop. Rather than jump ahead to Ash Wednesday and Lent or the cross, can we stay on the mountain and reflect on our reactions to divine encounters? Do we reach for our phones to record the sunset the view, the baby's face that took shape in nine short months? Do we seek to contain wonder, or do we seek to absorb awe into our hearts? Lent is coming. Change is also coming. We anticipate that the open position for faith formation will be filled. We anticipate the retirement of our senior minister and the end of Reverend Joanna's term as designated minister. We anticipate that we will have a full contingent of spiritual leadership. These changes will bring with them revelations of the divine at work in our lives and our church. I do not yet know what is in store for us or who will lead us in nine months. I trust, though, I trust and have every confidence that God will be in this place to travel with us and to reveal God's self to us. I have confidence that the ministry of social justice that is a cornerstone of First Church will not fall away, but it will be strong. I have confidence that the bonds of relationship in the congregation and community will grow, that we will join together to hear God calling us to embody the teachings of Jesus in Columbus, Ohio. And I am confident that the example of Washington Gladden will continue to guide us with faith, with fairness, and friendship. 
Peter, James, and John encountered wonder on that mountain. The ancient Israelites, wandering in the desert, as well as in the Lord's Prayer, have given us a model of how to deal with wonder. What would happen if we expected, or accepted, accepted wonder as our daily bread, never collecting more than we need, but only collecting just what we need for today? What would happen if we trusted that God will continue to re reveal God's self to us in everyday experiences, not just at the mountaintops? Would we be free to drink wonder more deeply? Would we, would we relinquish our need to control wonder in the future? Our encounters with wonder give us a context for God's vastness and vision. We are meant to take that knowledge with us into our everyday lives, back down into the valleys of life. But let's not rush it. For today, let's enjoy the view from the mountaintop, drinking in wonder as if it were vital, because it is vital. This is my prayer for us today. May we open our ears to God speaking. May we sit in the mystical moments of God's presence. May we be filled with spiritual grace. Open our hearts to see God's blessings, the encouragement of our friends, and the support of our family with the bond of love that unites us all.